ODI cricket was massive in the early 2000s. Well, if any of you watching don't know who this man is, let me introduce you to him. Mark, classic shot, classic shot. The first flowering of Lara. Crowds were good, even at places like Lords that had trouble fully committing to the new format. Free-to-air TV companies loved the hundred ads they could fit into each day, and cable broadcasters enjoyed just how much content there suddenly was. 50 overs cricket wasn't new. It had started in 1971, but it was the 90s when it completely took off. Then came an ECB focus group, which inspired the birth of T20 cricket, a popular club format that the ECB brought in to bring evening crowds to their grounds. And despite its success in England, it actually took a while for other leagues to finally follow suit as well. That's because it was a novelty, realistically a marketing gimmick that no one took all that seriously, least of all the players. Now it is the cash register and political muscle of cricket. But that only happened when one of the fastest growing nations on earth partnered with one of the fastest growing sports. And at the end of that, cricket had a big bang. If you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a two-year contract with a discount plus four extra months plus gifts in some markets. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a blocker protects the stumps with Nord VPN today. Before T20 took over and in the early wave of the ODI madness, there was a man called Lalit Modi, who of course had left America after a story that included drugs and kidnapping and all sorts of not so much fun things. He wanted a city-based, privately owned team league, which would feature Indian and foreign players. It was essentially the IPL, but for 50 over cricket and in the 90s. Now this was more than a decade before anyone had thought about anything like this. And despite being a visionary, he quite understandably rubbed up a lot of people the wrong way. Also, cricket was just not ready for this kind of thinking. When Martin Crow invented Cricket Max, people laughed at him. But by 2007, people were starting to look at the model of cricket and think maybe other things could work. And weirdly enough, the first actual franchise league would not be Lalit Modi's creation, but the rebel Indian Cricket League, or as we now know it, the ICL. A doomed, unprofessional mess of a tournament with so much max fixing and other things going on, but also a little bit of early success. That finally got the richest cricket board in the world, the BCCI, to begin a franchise competition of their own. I mean, in many ways, the ICL was just a bad version of what Lalit Modi was trying to do. So the BCCI partnered with IMG to make a good version. That became the Indian Premier League and was put together in 2007. Coincidentally, the same year in which we saw the first T20 World Cup, although it wasn't actually called that at the time. And that was a tournament that the BCCI had argued against. And then their senior most players did not even turn up for. But a lot changed when Misbah Al-Haq spooned a small to short fine leg against a young team of Indian players led by a guy you may have heard of, MS Dhoni. This tournament went from not mattering to being India's first world title since 1983. The combination of that World Cup and this new tournament came together with excitement that we'd never seen before. And so by the time we got to the first auction, five teams, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, Punjab and Kolkata signed Vrinda Sehwag, Sachin Tendulkar, Rahul Dravid, Yuvraj Singh and Saurabh Ganguly as their icon players. Guys who weren't actually playing in that other league some of which who didn't actually want to play in that T20 World Cup. But the difference here was the teams were given a purse of 5 million USD at the auction, but had to spend a minimum of 3.3 million. Interestingly enough, the Rajasthan Royals were actually fined after the first round of auctioning for not spending the minimum amount. We'll get to them later. MS Dhoni sparked a bidding war, coming away with a price tag of 1.5 million USD, making him the first millionaire and most expensive buyer of the auction. Andrew Simons and the 38-year-old Sanus Jayasuriya were the next most expensive, going at 1.35 and 975k. 
Now, cricket wasn't used to millionaires, or even playing payers their worth. Now they were being auctioned off in prime time like livestock. And organisers were also keen on exposing younger players, and so assigned two Indian under-19s to each franchise. Delhi actually had the first pick there and could have gone with Virat Kohli, and they didn't. This first tournament also had Pakistan players, but they were unofficially banned in 2009, or shadow banned, or they just stopped getting picked. While the Rebel League, the ICL, actually had a team called the Lahore Badshahs. The tournament's opening ceremony was far more extravagant than cricket was used to. Bollywood was now a part of cricket, but not just in the entertainment side. People like Shah Rukh Khan were actually owners. They were involved in the franchises. At least their images were. But it was the business side that meant a lot more, with names like Mukesh Ambani and Vijay Malia amongst the franchise owners. Of course, perhaps the most important businessman was still Lalit Modi who requested to be on screen as much as possible and sometimes would have two phones, one to each ear, having conversations. It's also important to note that the cricket looked different. Brendan McCullum strolled into the middle adorned in a gold helmet and pads to match. And if that wasn't captivating enough, he then took down the RCB bowling lineup, swinging his bat like a gladiator in the Coliseum, which is also what he was supposed to represent for a team called the Knight Riders although that name seemingly had been taken from a 1982 TV show about a talking car. But McCullum smashed 158 from 73 balls. The only other batter in the KKR lineup to score at faster than a runner ball was Muhammad Hafiz. He made five of three. The IPL might have been a success without that knock, but this exploded that first game. It is still one of the greatest T20 innings ever played. This tournament was entertaining consistently. It had the high scoring games and low scoring thrills you need when you were starting a new venture. It also had new stars being born from absolutely nowhere, like MS Goni. Before to be a star, you needed to be in the top 11 players in your nation and probably in the top four or five. Now you just needed three good T20 matches and an interesting backstory. But the big name players were there as well. Shane Warne was part player and part promoter of this league and RCB signed up all the best test players from around the world. And the crowds flocked in numbers that made no sense for domestic cricket. And the TV audiences were crazy, even for India and even for Indian cricket. Weirdly enough, on the field, all the major awards from the first season went to overseas players. Sean Marsh was a late entrant to the tournament and ended up as the highest run scorer and the first ever winner of the orange cap, a thing that we didn't really even have in cricket before. The left-hander had underperformed in his career at that point and he signed for just 30,000 US dollars for the Kings 11 Punjab. But he scored 616 runs at a strike rate of 139 and was a huge figure in what was one of their best seasons ever, which of course isn't saying a lot, but still. Sohail Sanvir was by far the most effective Pakistani player in the tournament. Again, relatively unknown, he was wrong-footed and a left arm quick, and like Marsh, didn't even play in all of his side's games, but he picked up the most wickets in the tournament, 22 in 11 matches at a strike rate of 11 balls per wicket. He also became the first to pick up a five wicket haul in the IPL, and actually it was a six wicket haul, six for 14. No one beat that in the IPL for a long time. And while he never played in the IPL again, which is remarkable in so many different ways, he went on to have a hugely successful career as a T20 specialist everywhere else. Those two were fairly unknown, but the other player who won an award, not so much. Shane Watson was well established but he had never quite lived up to his early hype. And realistically, a lot of people thought that Shane Watson would never be a successful international cricketer. He had, though, an incredible short burst in the 2007 World Cup, but people didn't really pay all that much attention to it. But for those five weeks in India, he was a beast. His best performance came in the semi-finals against the Delhi Daredevils, now the Delhi Capitals. He belted 52 from 29 to help Rajasthan post 192, And then with his opening spell, he ended any hope of a Delhi chase with 3 for 10. He finished fourth on the list of wicket takers and run scorers, and he became the IPL's first MVP. But the thing is, it wasn't just about cricket. The IPL was a little bit of a fantasy, especially for slightly older fans. For instance, Sachin Tendulkar and Sanash Jayasuriya walked out to bat together for the Mumbai Indians. If you grew up in the 90s, that almost would blow your mind. Glenn McGrath and Mohamed Asif opened the bowling together for Delhi Daredevils. Have we ever had two more perfect wrists from either end? 
and even in the things that didn't quite work, like the fact that we had the hardest to dismiss test pairing maybe of all time together in a T20 game when Raul Dravid and Shiv Chandraval batted. But the whole thing was so different. Like, there were sponsors for boundaries. We no longer said sixes, we said maximums. And of course, there was cheerleaders. But not only was this an idea taken from America, it was cheerleaders from America and flown over. And there was all sorts of allegations of sexist and racist behavior around that. Plus, there was a lot of people who were just upset at dancing girls at the cricket. VJ Marley actually hired his cheerleaders from the Washington Redskins, but that team is no longer called the Washington Redskins, and VJ Marley is no longer the owner of the Royal Challengers Bangalore, and the Royal Challengers Bangalore is no longer the Royal Challengers Bangalore. There's a lot of changes that have gone on since that first season. There was also weird stuff going on on the field. Harbhajan Singh took down Tree Sand. And even now, no one exactly knows the full details, but Harbhajan's emotions seem to have been bubbling over after three consecutive losses for Mumbai. And all we know is that Punjab's Sri Sant, who obviously would be involved in far more controversial things from the IPL later on, was caught sobbing uncontrollably on camera. After an investigation, Harbhajan was suspended for the rest of the tournament. And that wasn't the only player ousted. Mohamed Asif was banned for a year after he tested positive for steroids. Again, maybe not the most controversial thing he did in cricket. But by the time his ban was lifted, Pakistan players were no longer welcome. But do you remember that team we mentioned before that didn't use all of their salary, the Rajasthan Royals? Well, while the other teams stacked their squads with stars, Rajasthan went in the opposite direction. In fact, because they didn't have many big name players, a lot of people who took it seriously, and realistically, not too many people were actually paying attention, but those who did thought they might come in around the bottom of the table. And when they lost their first game by nine wickets, even more so. But from then on in, they went on an incredible run of 11 wins in the next 13 games to end up topping the standings. And of course, they would go on to win the entire tournament. And they also may have been the first Moneyball team we've seen in cricket. And our sport had been state-run for years, but suddenly businessmen wanted results and decisions had to be justified. And after being overlooked for Australian leadership for off-field reasons, Shane Warne was the captain and coach of Rajasthan and had this team of misfit toys underneath him that he could kind of do whatever he wanted with. And Warne took this incredibly seriously and seemed to see it as a chance to prove that he should have captained Australia all those years. And some of the players he had were completely unseen or untested, like Neeraj Patel, Sotnil Asnotkar, Ravi Jadeja and Yusuf Patan, plus other players like Shane Watson and Graeme Smith and Sohail Tanvir, with Warne sort of as the main puppet master. And in his own words, he described it as just one of those things that was meant to be. And the truth is that in 2008, T20 cricket was at its absolute infancy. Even in England, they've been playing it for a few years, but they were still trying to work it out. Be it strategy or squad building or even team combinations, it seemed like no one really had a great idea about what to do. Most of it was just trial and error. And compare that to now where analytics are one of the most integral parts of the game and the IPL is a huge leader in that. And this is even more remarkable because when this tournament started, there were traditions saying that the IPL and all T20 cricket, but almost specifically the IPL as well, wasn't real cricket. At the same time, other boards were trying to replicate its success before that first season had even finished. But in 17 years, the IPL has gone above and beyond anyone's imagination. A juggernaut of an event with no signs of slowing down. And the interesting thing is now that ODI Cricket's heyday was really 1992 until 2000. And the IPL has been more successful for pretty much that same period of time. And while there are people who thought it would work, there's a difference between thinking it will be a success and having it outgrown almost everyone's dreams except for Lalit Modi. Of course, he can no longer enjoy it because he's not even in the country. And as a cricket watcher who grew up watching the international game, the first tournament was confusing and bizarre. It was like Indian capitalism spray painted over cricket. And to show what a different world it was back then, before the first game, the captains went out and signed the MCC's Spirit of Cricket Pledge. That whole thing seems like it's from another world now. Something very English and old school. The idea of the IPL needing to sign something from the MCC now just doesn't seem like it would even happen anymore. And really, what those players were doing that day was not some sort of packed about spirit. They were signing on to buy the game. And cricket has been the IPLs ever since. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer and so that I don't really know the game. 
Well, you know what they can't claim? Then I don't know deaths. I've been using deaths for years. I'm a collector of deaths, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit. This is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen and it has under desk cable management. But really the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional adjustable upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings.